Dear readers, welcome to our channel. Is it true? In August 2023, Russia's high-performance computing chip design company Baikal announced the sale of its circuit designs and intellectual property, seemingly halted due to the bankruptcy of its parent company T-Platforms. What has caused the ups and downs in the semiconductor industry in Russia? In this era of technological giants, where is Russia's chip dream heading? Is it a historical sediment, or the ruthless impact of sanctions? In late August 2023, Russia's only two high-performance computing chip design companies, including Baikal, announced the sale of their circuit designs and intellectual property, due to the bankruptcy of the parent company T-Platforms in October 2021. In December 2021, the Moscow court decided to introduce external oversight procedures for T-Platforms. Faced with a 10-year prison sentence, T-Platform's former CEO Vsevolodo Panasenko plans to file for bankruptcy himself. This academic-oriented supercomputer design company, stemming from Moscow University, is forced to be accountable for failing to timely complete government orders and is required to repay a subsidy of 2.76 billion rubles provided by Russian authorities in early 2016. The subsidy aimed to produce 10 to 20,000 desktops and servers with domestically produced Russian chips. The root cause of this subsidy dates back more than a decade when T-Platforms provided Moscow University with two Lomonosov supercomputers. These supercomputers used Intel E5 CPUs and NVIDIA Tesla compute cards. The latest Lomonos of 2, in 2023, still ranks 329th with a peak performance of 5 plops and a Linpack value of 2.5 plops. However, the US imposed sanctions on Moscow University and T-Platforms for various reasons after 2014. The planned upgrade in early 2018 was hastily concluded, with Lomonos of 2 adding only about 100 new server nodes. This prompted T-Platforms to embark on the challenging path of developing its own chips. After the initial success of the T-1000, Baikal announced a transformation into an ARM architecture-based chip design company, outlining three product lines, M, S, and L. The first product, M1000, featured 8A57 cores, TSMC 28 nanometers technology, and a clock speed of 1.5 GHz. This chip achieved small-scale success in certain scenarios, and Russian media proudly claimed that this domestically developed chip could rival the Intel i3-7100T. Formal mass production began in the second half of 2021. With the significant progress of M1000 compared to T1000, Baikal decided to enter the server and high-performance computing field, introducing the most powerful self-developed server chip in Russia to date, S1000. This chip used ARM IP, featuring 48 A75 cores arranged in 12 groups on a ring bus. It also integrated a less notable RISC-V core for on-chip system security. The design of S1000 was influenced to some extent by the ARM server trend of that time. In the fourth quarter of 2017, two years before the initiation of this chip, Qualcomm announced the release of an ARM server chip, Centric 2400, also with 48 cores. Additionally, S1000 planned a successor, S2000, scheduled for mass production in 2025 featuring ARM N2 cores, initially targeting Ampere's ARM server CPU Ultra, Q80-26.80 TSMC 16 nanometers process. The S1000 had an area exceeding 600 square millimeters, but due to the sanctions resulting from the Russo-Ukrainian war, the chip came to a standstill. Baikal attempted to continue production at other overseas foundries and transform the IP into a RISC-V core to bypass sanctions, but faced challenges in funding and acquiring users. The L-series remained at the RTL stage, mainly for mobile devices, using a four-core design comparable to Qualcomm's 8CX series. 
This summarizes all of Bakel's work in recent years. Another high-performance computing chip design company in Russia, MCST, is known for its VLIW architecture. The leader of the company, Boris Babayon, at the age of 90, proposed the theory of superscalar processing, leading the West by more than 10 years. MCST has two product lines, Elbrus 2000 for civilian use and Elbrus 90 based on the Spark architecture for military use, both relying on TSMC's foundry. Russia has only two semiconductor fabs, Micran and Angstrom, inherited from the Soviet era. Micron was the first company in the Soviet Union to manufacture large-scale digital and analog integrated circuits. Angstrom, established in Zelenograd, Russia, produces 130 nanometers chips and attempted to upgrade to 90 nanometers. However, due to failed sanctions, it went bankrupt. Currently, Micron can only satisfy small-scale production and Angstrom is under the control of a bank. Russia's microelectronics industry faces the first and second winters. Russia cannot escape U.S. chip sanctions as China has, perhaps due to the Soviet Union's dissolution and its alignment with NATO. Although T-Platform's bankruptcy has temporarily pushed Russia's high-performance chip design back to the conceptual stage, exploration and IP development of RISC-V continue. While Lomonosov 2 has not reached its design goals, it continues to operate. Yandex's AI supercomputer and MSU 270's 400p AI computing power have not met domestic demands. However, Chinese manufacturers such as Huawei's High Silicon, Lungsun, Fishium, and Shenwei have launched advanced designs under the domestic 14 nanometers process demonstrating that the dragon has undergone a fundamental transformation compared to the bear.in conclusion. Let me summarize for readers, hoping you gain insights and thoughts. In the tortuous journey of Russia's semiconductor industry, we have witnessed not only the rise and fall of technology, but also glimpses of a country's exploration in technological innovation. This journey has brought a series of inspirations and reflections. Firstly, Technological sanctions can have a huge impact on a country's technological development. In the case of Russia, former partners turned to sanctions, directly causing stagnation in the chip industry. This raises an important question for other countries, in today's era of globalization. Should the field of technology move away from past political biases and jointly promote technological advancement with a more open mindset? Secondly, independent research and development are crucial for a country's technological strength. Although Russia attempted to develop chips independently when faced with sanctions, it struggled to sustain due to issues such as funding and technology. Does this suggest that a country's independent research and development in the field of technology not only require policy support, but also the collective efforts of society? Lastly, Technological development is closely related to international relations. In the era of globalization, a country's technological strength is constrained by both domestic and international factors. Dialogue, cooperation, and sharing are effective ways to promote technological development, rather than isolation and sanctions. What we need to consider is whether the construction of an international technological community can achieve shared prosperity among nations. That concludes today's video. Stay tuned for the next exciting content. Goodbye. Goodbye.